Today, our uh, speaker comes to us from the School of Pharmacy, Dr. Josh Sharp. Uh, he received his uh, BS in microbiology from UT Knoxville. He then went on to get his PhD in genome science and technology from University of Tennessee and Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He's an associate professor of pharmacology. He's associate professor of chemistry and biochemistry. He's a research assistant professor in the Research Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences. And in July, uh, he will have been here at uh, the university for six years. Uh, Dr. Sharp, I know that there is a ton more of accolades and awards and honors and things that you've written, um, your research interests uh, that I've not uh, gone over, but in the sake of uh, uh, time for uh, what we have to present today, I'm going to go ahead and cut it off and turn it over to you. So um, thank you, Dr. Sharp, for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Scott. And, and don't worry about it. I, I don't remember all of that stuff either. So don't feel too bad. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, to get to talk with uh, the community um, a little bit about a topic that I've gotten a lot of questions about. So I'm hoping that uh, hopefully this will uh, help some of you that are interested in learning a little bit more about these uh, new vaccines that have come out and some new and some other new vaccines that are in the pipeline, um, what exactly they are, um, what, what do we mean when we say they're, they're new or they're new technologies, how do they work? Um, and uh, uh, what you should expect out of them. Uh, just to, to expand a little bit on my background, um, very quick introduction. Uh, one thing I am not, I am not a medical doctor. So this should not be taken as medical advice. This is a scientific talk. Um, I'm going to try my best to give you the information as we best know it, um, but you should not take this as medical advice. Uh, what I am is an analytical biochemist who's done COVID-19 research. Uh, I have experience in viral structure and viral interactions with carbohydrates. Um, and it's from that perspective that I'm going to be talking to you to, today about, about these vaccines. Before we start, I want to make sure that we all have a common language. Uh, so I'm going to be using some of these terms, and I want to make sure that everyone understands what I mean when I say them. Um, some common terms I'm going to be using, COVID-19. COVID-19 is the name of the disease uh, that's, that's currently sweeping the globe. Um, hopefully, you have all heard of this. Uh, it's uh, common symptoms, uh, fever, cough, respiratory distress, fatigue, um, nausea, vomiting, um, and, and chest pain or tightness um, are, are some of the common ones. Um, a pathogen means an agent or a microorganism that causes an infectious disease. And SARS-CoV-2 is the pathogen or the virus that causes the disease COVID-19. And finally, when I say a vaccine, a vaccine is a product uh, that you give to a person that stimulates that person's immune system to produce some level of protection against a specific disease or toxin. So today we're going to talk about vaccines that produce immune responses that give you some level of protection against COVID-19. Now, to give you this talk today, uh, I'm basically going, basically going to have to take a two-year series on microbiology and immunology and condense it down to about 30 minutes. So um, there are going to be uh, gaps in what I tell you. Um, I'm going to fudge a few things. I'm gonna leave out a lot of detail. Um, if, if you take this information that I give you today and try to go out and argue with a virologist, you're gonna have a bad experience. But hopefully you'll walk away from this feeling like you you're a little bit more well-informed about what's going on with these vaccines and why they work the way they do. So when we talk about our immune systems and how we develop immunity to specific pathogens, okay, you're, you basically have two different categories of immunity. The first category is what we call innate immunity. And innate immunity is the part of your immune system that's working all the time. You have it from day one. And the innate immunity kicks in the moment that your body encounters a pathogen. Your innate immunity system, your innate immune system includes a lot of different parts, uh, including things like barriers. So your skin is part of your innate immune system. Uh, it also includes um, uh, de pattern detectors in, in your, inside your body that look for specific types of chemicals that are found on lots of different pathogens and identifies them and attacks them. Um, chemical warfare agents that your body uses to destroy pathogens, uh, self-destruction signals that your body uses to get infected cells to kill themselves, um, and attack cells that just go around and eat everything that just doesn't look quite right. Your innate immune system is very, very old. Uh, 
you will find innate immune systems in all most plants and animals. Um, and it works against lots of types of invaders. Uh, but the problem is, is that most pathogens that we consider to be actual pathogens, um, the reason why we consider them to be pathogens is because they figure out a way to deal with the innate immune system. So for most things that we now consider to be disease causing agents, um, your innate immune system in a lot of cases acts as kind of a way to um, slow down an infection, but in a lot of cases, it's not going to be enough to actually stop an infection. To stop the infection for a lot of these pathogens that have developed against humans, um, we require the second part of our immune system, which is known as the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system, uh, its job is to actually attack specific pathogens. It identifies new specific pathogens. It develops attack strategies that are specific to that pathogen. And then it remembers those strategies. So if it ever sees that same pathogen again, it will already have the arsenal ready to attack it quickly. Uh, the downside to the adaptive immune system is that the adaptive immune system takes time to work because the adaptive immune system has to recognize the new pathogen. It has to um, tailor the immune response to attack the new pathogen. And in this time that it's taking to identify the new pathogen and adapt to it, the pathogen is growing and multiplying in your body. And so it becomes somewhat of a race, which is going to happen first. Are you going to develop an effective immune response first or is the pathogen going to overwhelm you first? Um, the adaptive immune system um, involves both chemical attack agents that are specific to the pathogen. And we call these chemical attack agents that are specific to the pathogen antibodies and attack cells that recognize, the, the, uh, that recognize signals from the pathogen on infect infected cells and attack and destroy the infected cell. So in summary, your adaptive immune system is very specific, very, very effective, but it's slow to develop. And so it's the combination of the two, the fast but somewhat ineffective and the slow but very, very, very specific and very effective that we combine together to make our total immune response to a disease. We are going to focus today on the adaptive immune system because the adaptive immune system is what vaccines rely on in order to develop effective immune responses against specific diseases. And your adaptive immune system, we're gonna talk about two key components of your adaptive immune response. We're going to talk about B cells and we're going to talk about killer T cells. So let's start with the B cells. The job of the B cell is to develop a specific immune response to attack pathogens that are outside of your cells. So pathogens that are floating free, free in your bloodstream or in your lymph, um, anything that's not actually inside of another cell, that's the B cell's job is to recognize and attack these pathogens. And the way that it does that is through these, these specific chemical attack agents called antibodies. Now the issue is how do we generate specific antibodies for a pathogen that we've never seen before? So the way that it works is, is that your body is constantly making new B cells. And whenever it makes a new B cell, uh, the B cell is going to make a type of antibody. And it's going to figure out what type of antibody it makes in a semi-random uh, fashion, okay? So it's just going to randomly pick something that it could possibly attack, all right? And then what your body is going to do is it's going to take that new B cell with that semi-random antibody, and it's going to test that semi-random antibody against all of the stuff that's normally in your healthy body. If the B cell recognizes something that's in your healthy body, then the B cell gets killed. And we try again, because we don't want to build an immune response against the things that are in our normal healthy tissue. But if the B cell does not recognize anything in your body, then the B cell is released, and it goes around and it just looks for this one random thing that it can recognize. And every B cell recognizes a different random thing. And what happens is when we have a new pathogen that comes in, a B cell will randomly happen to recognize something on that pathogen. And when the B cell recognizes something on that pathogen randomly, then that B cell gets activated and it starts to multiply and make copies of itself. Now, as it makes copies of, these self, of itself, some of these copies are going to turn into a type of cell called a plasma cell that starts cranking out tons and tons of 
relatively weak antibodies, but it start, starts cranking them out pretty fast within a few days of recognizing the, the pathogen. Okay, and others of these B cells that are multiplying will, instead of cranking out these weak antibodies, they will undergo a, a modification and selection process where they take their semi-random antibody that recognize the pathogen and they start to tweak it and look for antibodies that recognize that same pathogen better, okay? More specifically, more effectively. Once we find the antibodies that recognize this pathogen really, really well and really, really specifically, then we will select that B cell, get rid of all of the others, and that particular B cell that recognizes that pathogen really specifically will be activated, start to make lots of copies of itself and start to crank out tons and tons of very, very specific, very, very effective antibodies. These antibodies float around. Whenever they find the pathogen, they bind very tightly to it and block the pathogen from being able to do its dirty business, okay? So the result is, after your system has had time to go through all of this selection and multiplication and selection and multiplication process, you end up with a large population of B cells making lots and lots of these antibodies that are very effective and very specific. After your body has cleared the infection, a lot of these um, immune cells will then die off because they're not needed anymore, the infection's gone. But some of them will go dormant and they will hang around in your system looking for that same pathogen to come back. And these are called your memory B cells, okay? And these are really the key to how vaccines work. One of the keys to how vaccines work is generating these memory B cells so that the next time the same pathogen comes around, you have a highly specific, highly effective chemical attack strategy ready to go. So those are your B cells. And remember, B cells attack pathogens on the outside because the antibodies, they float around in your bloodstream and whenever they see a pathogen, they stick to it and stop it and block it. But what happens when pathogens actually get inside of your cell and start hijacking your cell? Is there a way that we can stop them once they're hiding out in your cell? And the answer is yes. That is the other part of your uh, adaptive immune, immune system that we're going to talk about today, which are the killer T cells. And the job of the killer T cell is rather than to attack pathogens on the outside of your cells, the job of the killer T cell is to attack cells that have been infected by a pathogen. So a lot like B cells, your killer T cells or also known as CD8 positive T cells are made semi-randomly in the bone marrow. And each one is made specific for some chemical signal, okay? And just like B cells, T cells that are specific for chemical signals and healthy cells are screened out so that you don't attack your own body with your immune system. Now, during its normal day-to-day -day process, pretty much all the cells in your body will sample all of the stuff that's inside of the cell and it will hold it out on the outside of the cell as part of kind of a security check, all right? So you can think of, you can think of the killer T cells as the security guards and so, you know, Periodically, the cell will say, okay, what's going on in here? It'll grab some stuff and it'll stick it out on the outside and show the killer T cell. Here's what's going on inside the cell. We are making these chemicals right now. And the killer T cell will see the chemicals that are being displayed on the surface of the cell. And if they look like normal chemicals that belong in your healthy cells, they're fine. They move on to the next cell. But if they look foreign, if they're not right, then the T cell becomes activated and it starts making these, these chemical attack agents that attack the cell that's displaying the unusual chemical and kills it. After killing the cell, the activated T cell will then multiply so that it can go on and find even more cells that have been infected by the same thing and are therefore displaying the same unusual chemical signal on its surface. And it will continue to do this until the infection is cleared and then just like B cells, once the infection is cleared, a lot, of these, um, a lot of these specific killer T cells will die off, but some of them will go dormant and hang around in case the infection comes back, okay? Now, there are other types of T cells you might hear about in the news that, that act as kind of middle managers or facilitators for the immune response um, and, and kind of help both the killer T cells and the B cells. Um, we're gonna skip over that because we really don't have time. Okay, so now that I've given you the five cent tour of your immune system, 
Uh, let's talk about the, the opponent that we're dealing with here. This is the virus SARS-CoV-2, okay? SARS-CoV-2 is a, is a coronavirus. All right, that gives you kind of the type of virus it is. It's not the first coronavirus that has infected humans. Um, we have dealt with coronaviruses in the past. Uh, it, is, it does appear to be one of the more severe disease causing ones though. And let me give you a brief uh, view of what's going on here, okay? So in orange, you have this protein that sticks out on the exterior of the virus. This is called the S protein or the spike protein. This protein is involved in most of the interactions of the virus with your cell. So this, the S protein is how the uh, virus recognizes the cells it wants to infect, how it convinces the cell to pull it inside of itself, and then how it breaks into the cell and starts to do its dirty business. So the S protein is what gives it entry into the cell, okay? The M protein shown here in purple, the M protein helps hold the whole structure together into this nice regular shape. Uh, the E protein um, helps uh, organize uh, a, uh, a layer of um, kind of like fats that the virus steals from the cells in order to protect itself. It, it coats itself in this envelope of fats and the E protein helps organize all that. On the inside of the virus, on the, of the virus, you have the viral genome. This is what includes the instructions for making all of the parts of the virus. And the viral genome is made out of RNA. So our genome as humans is made out of DNA, which is a very, very sturdy, very stable molecule. The viral genome is actually made out of RNA. And we'll talk about why that's important in just a bit. Um, what's important to understand is that RNA is much more delicate and fragile than, than uh, DNA. It's much easier to fall apart. And this RNA is packaged up along with these copies of the N protein shown here in blue. And the purpose of the N protein is basically to help wind this RNA into this tight compact ball so it will fit on the inside of this virus. So this is uh, the dirty bugger that gets into your airways and infects your cells. Okay, so as you can see, if we are wanting to attack this virus with a antibody, right? The antibody is going to encounter the virus here on the outside. So what part of the virus is it going to encounter? It's not going to encounter the RNA. It's not going to encounter the N protein. It's going to encounter this S protein, these big spikes that are sticking out all over the surface of the virus. So this S protein, if you ever get infected with COVID-19, this S protein is the protein that a large amount of your immune response, your specific B cell response, is going to be geared toward attacking this S protein because this S protein is what your immune system is mostly going, what your B cells are mostly going to see. T cells on the other hand, remember they sample everything that your infected cell makes. So T cells will get to see parts of all of these different proteins and nucleic acids. So a T cell response can be made against anything as, as the virus is being made inside your cell but the B cells, they mostly see the spike protein because the antibody doesn't get on the inside of the virus. Okay, so to understand the viral life cycle, I gotta teach you a little bit about how your cells live day to day. All right, so we're gonna do some really, really quick molecular biology. How do your cells handle their business? So inside each of your cells, you have a copy of your DNA, two copies actually. And the DNA includes the instructions for how to make just about everything in your body, okay? There are blueprints in the DNA, but it's, that's just it. You know, they're blueprints, they're instructions, okay? Your body does not make proteins directly out of reading the instructions and making the protein, all right? If your, body, if your cell wants to make a particular protein, what it does is it finds the instructions for making that protein and it makes a piece of RNA, okay? Because remember, RNA is delicate. DNA is sturdy, it's, it's almost permanent. RNA is delicate. So when your, when your cell wants to make a particular protein at a particular time, it will find that instruction and it will start making copies of RNA, I like to call them work orders, okay? Make this protein right now, okay? It'll make lots and lots of copies of this RNA work order. And then your cell, We'll see the RNA work order and go, yep, time to make that protein. And it will start making proteins out of 
from reading the instructions on how to make the protein out of the RNA work order, okay? And because the RNA is delicate, it doesn't last that long. And so if your cell wants to stop making the protein, it can just stop making RNA and the RNA will fall apart inside of your cell within a few hours to a day. All right, so what does this have to do with SARS-CoV-2? So SARS-CoV-2 encounters your cell and it wants to make copies of itself. It wants to replicate. Because it's a virus, it has to have the machinery of your cell in order to make copies of itself. So what does it do? It infects your cell, it gets pulled inside, it opens up and it puts its RNA into your cell. And your cell looks at the RNA and it thinks it's just another work order. So it looks at the instructions and it starts making proteins out of the RNA that it sees because it thinks it's just another work order. And so it starts making copies of the S protein. It starts making copies of the N protein, the M protein, the E protein. And it also makes another protein that's actually really, really important. So in your healthy cell, if your cell wants to divide, then what your cell does is your cell will take its DNA and it will make a copy of its DNA. And then it will put one copy in the old cell and one copy in the new cell so that every cell maintains this, the right amount of DNA. Your cell has no way of copying RNA. Your cell has no way of copying proteins. It only copies DNA. But the virus has an RNA genome. And if it wants to make more virus, it needs more copies of that RNA genome. So one of the proteins that is included in this work order that your cell sees is a protein called RDRP. And what RDRP does is it makes copies of RNA out of RNA. So it will look at the RNA genome of the virus and it will make more copies of the RNA genome of the virus. And so you're making all of the protein parts of the virus, you're making RNA genomes for the virus, they get packaged up inside of your cell and they leave your cell to start infecting other cells. And that's how the, vi the virus spreads in your body and to other people. So now you have an idea of the immune response, you have an idea of the life cycle of the virus. Now let's talk about the vaccines. We're gonna focus on five different vaccines today, okay? There are many, many, many more, all right? There are well over 20 vaccines that are currently in some stage of development or have been released in some country. We're gonna focus on five uh, that are either approved, they have emergency use authorization in the United States, they've applied for emergency use authorization in the United States, or they're expected to apply fairly soon. So these are, the, these are the vaccines that if I were a betting man, I would say these are the ones that are most likely to cause an impact here in the US in the near future. Okay, the two that currently have emergency youth authorization, authorizations are the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine. These are the vaccines that are currently be, been giving, being given out. I myself received the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, some of the people in the audience may have received the Moderna vaccine. All right, both of these vaccines are a type of vaccine known as RNA vaccines or mRNA vaccines. And we will talk about what that means. Another vaccine that's been in the news a lot lately is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. They have recently applied for emergency use authorization, which means that they hope to be approved within the next three or four weeks to start dispensing this vaccine in the United States. Unlike the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, Johnson & Johnson uses a different technology for the vaccine called an adenovirus, and we'll talk about that. Next, there's the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. This is the vaccine that's currently approved in the United Kingdom, as well as some other countries. They are expected to apply for authorization in the United States soon. Uh, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine is another adenovirus vaccine. And then finally, you have the Novavax vaccine. The Novavax vaccine is still in clinical trials. It's very late in clinical trials. They're still collecting data, um, but there's enough data out there right now for us to make some preliminary uh, measurements of how effective it is. So of these five vaccines, only one of them is using a technology that has previously been FDA approved for use in humans. And that is the Novavax vaccine, the one that is farthest away from being approved by the FDA or given emergency use authorization by the FDA. So we need to talk about what these different types of technologies are 
and how they work. Because although they haven't been used in humans in an FDA approved manner, they have been around for quite some time. And they've been in clinical trials in humans for different diseases for quite some time. So we still know a good bit about them, even though this is their first approved use um, in humans. Uh, let's talk real briefly about their effectiveness against COVID-19, because I know that's one question that's on a lot of people's minds, is which vaccine is best, right? Okay, so um, first we'll start talking about this bottom row here, effectiveness against all COVID-19. So this is how many people, um, what percentage of people uh, seem to be protected from having any symptoms of COVID-19, okay? And you'll see it's a range. That's because this is all based on statistics. And so there's a range, right? There's an average number, which is the number you'll see in the newspaper, uh, but there's, there's some uncertainty around that number. And I'm trying to capture that uncertainty when I can here by giving you the actual range of, it's in between these numbers, okay? So for both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, um, they are both equally effective. You can't really tell the difference between the two of them. Both of them stop between about 90 and 97% uh, of COVID-19, okay? Um, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, um, they kind of made some mistakes in their clinical trials that make it really, really hard for us to tell exactly how effective it is. Uh, so it appears to be somewhere around 40 to 75% effective. Um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, and you'll know anything that has this asterisk next to it means there's still not enough data for us to really nail down exactly how effective this or, or how precise this number is. So these are just my my best kind of calls based on what's out there, but take it take it with some uncertainty around it. Um, the Johnson 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 vaccine it appears to be roughly 66% effective, uh, and the Novavax vaccine appears to be roughly 90% effective based on the data we have so far. But remember, Novavax is still collecting data. Um, the other thing that's important is their effectiveness against serious cases of COVID-19, because some vaccines, even though they might, you might still get some symptoms if you get infected, they'll keep you from getting serious symptoms. And that's really important with COVID-19, right? Uh, if, if all this thing did was give us another common cold, it wouldn't be such a big deal. It's the fact that this thing hospitalizes people, kills people. That's, that's why we've all been wearing masks and staying, staying at home so much. So if we can stop serious cases of COVID-19, even if we can't stop all COVID-19, that's still a big deal. And the good news is pretty much all of the vaccines that we have so far appear to be very good at stopping serious COVID-19 cases. Uh, both Moderna and Pfizer are very, very high uh, in their percentage of serious COVID-19 they've stopped. So is AstraZeneca. The Johnson Johnson vaccine appears to be a little bit lower. Uh, part of that is because uh, they ran a big part of their clinical trial in South Africa, and we'll talk about why that's that's an issue um, later today. Uh, Novavax also seems to be very, very strong against serious, uh, serious cases of COVID-19. So all of that actually looks really good, okay? So just to give you some, clar some, uh, some clarification, some, some perspective, all right? Uh, these numbers for a vaccine are very good numbers. This is, these, are, these are excellent vaccines as far as effectiveness goes. Let's talk a little bit about how they work because a lot of people are really concerned because they hear and they read in the news, these are brand new technologies, brand new types of vaccines, and they have people really worried. And they think that we don't know much about how these vaccines work. We don't know what could be going on with these vaccines. It makes them really hesitate to get the vaccines. What I wanna show you is, is that these Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, while they're new, um, they're very, very well understood. And what actually makes them, in my opinion, so very, very elegant is that the idea is really, really simple. And it's a really, really beautiful idea once you understand it. The Pfizer and Moderna RNA vaccines, what they do is kind of like the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself, they take an, a piece of RNA, a work order. This, this is a work order to make just one part of that SARS-CoV-2 um, virus, which is the S protein. Remember, that's the part of the virus that, your aunt, that, that the B cells are most likely to see. Um, and so they just take a piece of RNA that makes that S protein. They've done a little bit of engineering to the S protein to make it more stable. 
so that it looks the way it should look to your immune system. But by and large, it's just the S protein message. It's just the work order to make the S protein. And they wrap it inside of something called a liposome. All right, so um, this is a technology that's been in development for about 20 years now, um, more than 20 years now. Um, it's been in development for a lot of different applications. Um, it was in development to try to make vaccines against cancer. Um, it's been considered as a way to try to uh, get specific cells to make specific proteins for other non-vaccine purposes. Okay, And we were just really fortunate that this technology really reached maturity just in time for us to apply it to this pandemic. And the key to why this technology meets, reached maturity was not in the RNA itself. The RNA, pretty, pretty straightforward. The key is how we actually package the RNA. Because remember, RNA is super delicate and your body makes tons and tons and tons of dedicated stuff to just break down any RNA that it finds because it doesn't want foreign RNA floating around in its body. And so, what really, really made this vaccine work is this liposome, this, this layer of uh, chemicals that we wrap the RNA in. And when I say chemicals, I, I don't mean harsh chemicals or anything like that. These are essentially uh, a specialized biological equivalent of a soap bubble, okay? So these look a lot like the molecules that you would find in, in your dish detergent. They're just, they're just, tuned to protect the RNA inside kind of like a little soap bubble. Uh, and what we do is we inject this into your muscles, right? Um, and this soap bubble will protect the RNA and help it get into some of your cells. When the RNA gets into your cell, your cell sees the work order to make the S protein. It's like, oh, I got to make S protein and it starts making S protein. And when it makes S protein, some of the S protein, it will release into the bloodstream. So now you've got S protein floating around in your bloodstream. And some of it, it will hold out to the T cell security guards and say, yep, here's what we're making right now. And so your immune system sees, your B cells see the, see the S protein floating around in the bloodstream and starts building an immune response to S protein. And your T cells, see the S protein that your, that your cells are holding out and start building up killer T cell response against cells that have been infected with anything that makes the S protein. And so these RNA vaccines are very, very, actually pretty simply able to trick your cell into making part of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, but it's just one part of the virus, okay? It doesn't make all of the parts of the virus, and it especially does not make that um, RDRP, that, that protein that you need to make copies of the genome of the virus, okay? So it cannot cause COVID-19. The vaccine cannot cause COVID-19, but it makes that one piece of the protein that's easiest for your immune system to recognize, so your immune system is ready to attack that protein when the time comes. And because the only thing you're adding in is RNA, which is very delicate and breaks down very quickly, and this kind of natural soap bubble, there's not a whole lot of stuff floating around in your body that wouldn't normally be there anyway. Once this gets into your cell, it all just gets broken down. And so there's no real lingering anything, okay? It's all pretty straightforward, pretty clean, um, and not a whole lot to really irritate your, your immune system at all. It's actually a really, really clever way, uh, clever technology for, for building vaccines and one that I think you're gonna see a lot more of in the near future. Let's talk about the technology that's been used for the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccines, the adenovirus. Um, the adenovirus vaccine, uh, it has been approved for use in animals. So there is an adenovirus vaccine that's used in wild animals to protect against rabies. Uh, and it's been used in experimental vaccines in humans. So for example, the Ebola vaccine uh, is an adenovirus-based vaccine, uh, but it has not been FDA approved for use in humans yet. It works on a very, very similar system. Uh, the, 
big difference being that instead of using a liposome to smuggle RNA work orders into the cell, it uses another virus, an adenovirus, to smuggle DNA into your cell. And the DNA contain instructions for how to make the S protein. Now, adenoviruses are a type of virus that, among other things, cause a lot of the cases of the common cold that we have. And so, you know, they're viruses that we're pretty familiar with. Um, both of these vaccines use what's called a non-replicating adenovirus, which means they've cut out all the parts that the virus needs to make copies of itself. All it can do is attack, uh, is attached to a cell and deliver its DNA cargo, and that's it. And the DNA cargo instructs the cell to make S protein kind of like the RNA vaccine does, okay? So you put the instructions for how to make the, uh, the uh, S protein on the inside, you build the adenovirus around it, you inject the adenovirus into people, the adenovirus infects your cells, releases the cargo, which makes the S protein, but doesn't make anything else. Now, the big problem with adenoviruses and why adenoviruses have had some issues in the past is that I told you that adenoviruses are some of the viruses that cause the common cold. We've seen a lot of adenoviruses before, just in our day-to-day -day life. And if they package this DNA inside of an adenovirus that your body has seen before, then your body will have built an immune response to the vaccine itself. It will recognize the adenovirus as an invader that it's seen before, and it will start attacking it with B cells, with the antibodies that it makes. And if you attack the virus and kill the, I mean, if you attack the vaccine and kill the vaccine, it doesn't really vaccinate you very well. And so um, to, to overcome this, AstraZeneca and J&J &J have, have chosen adenoviruses that you are much less likely to have seen in the past. Um, Johnson & Johnson uses a human adenovirus that is kind of uncommon, so not that many people have encountered it before. Um, AstraZeneca um, actually uses a adenovirus that infects chimpanzees. Um, it can still infect humans, but it doesn't in, in, in the normal wild. So chances are you haven't seen the, uh, the chimpanzee adenovirus before unless you work with chimpanzees or something. Uh, and so that makes it much less likely that your body will attack the vaccine itself. And you'll instead be able to infect your cells and build up immunity uh, to the S protein that the vaccine instructs your cells to make. And then the final vaccine that we're gonna talk about is the Novavax vaccine. This actually uses a uh, more tried and true approach, which is that rather than tricking your cells into making S protein, uh, the Novavax vaccine is just S protein. We make S protein inside of uh, a, a cell culture. Uh, this is a cell culture of, of uh, actually insect cells, fall armyworm cells. Uh, we make the S protein. Uh, they then take this S protein and they mix it with a chemical uh, and the job of the chemical is actually to make your immune system upset. So you, you, you mix the S protein with this, this tiny, tiny little particle of chemicals uh, that pretty much just irritate your immune system. You know, it waves a giant flag and says, hey, 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 look over here. Here's something that you should pay attention to. Um, and, and adding this to the S protein really makes the immune system much more likely to build a strong response uh, to the S protein. Um, and that's kind of the key to this technology is, you know, this is called subunit, a recombinant subunit vaccine. You just make a part of the, of the virus and, and inoculate people with that. Um, and this is one of the simpler, more classical methods, but it's also one of the methods that fails more often um, for lots of reasons. Um, and, and this Novavax nanoparticle is one of the key steps that really helps them helps them succeed in this case, helps them build a strong immune response against the, against the S protein. So some important information that lots of people always ask all the time. Uh, the first is, are the RNA vaccines safe since they're new? Um, and the answer is yes. The short answer is yes, they are very, very safe actually. Um, and part of that is because they are so simple and they are made up mostly of stuff that exists anyway in your body. Um, so let's talk about numbers. Uh, the rate of anaphylaxis, which is a, a, a severe, serious allergic reaction. Uh, for the Pfizer vaccine, it's between 5 and, a mil and 11 cases per million first doses. In the Moderna vaccine, it's about 2.5 cases per million first doses. 
And again, these two numbers are, so, are both so small that it's hard to say that they're any different. So the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are both very, very safe. The majority of anaphylactic reactions occurs in patients that have a history of allergies, and it usually occurs within 15 minutes. So when you go get your vaccine, one of the things they'll ask you is, do you have a history of allergies? And the other thing they'll make you do is they'll make you wait 15 minutes after injection so they can keep an eye on you. Um, curiously, the vast majority of anaphylaxis cases were in women. I don't know why. Um, there are also some non-serious allergic reactions. Uh, they were very, very low. So for example, for the Pfizer vaccine, uh, there were reports of non-serious allergic reactions in 0.63%, whereas in the people that got the placebo, it was 0.5%. So very, very similar numbers uh, between vaccine and placebo. Um, if you're looking just at all cause mortality, how many people died after they got the vaccine versus died after they got the placebo, no matter what they died of, um, actually fewer people died after getting the vaccine than after getting the placebo. Um, so all cause mortality is lower for the vaccine than background. And then uh, finest, finally, non-serious adver adverse events. Yes, there are non-serious adverse events. Um, as someone that got the vaccine myself, I can tell you it's sore, right? Um, it's, it's, it's eliciting a very strong immune response from your immune system right in the area where you get the injection and it makes things sore and tender. Um, and, and that's actually a very, very common adverse event. Um, it's a little bit worse after the second shot because your immune system is already ready for it. And so the immune response is a little bit stronger. And so the soreness is a little worse after the second shot for most people. Um, less common are what's called systemic effects or body-wide effects. And they are usually something like fever, a mild fever, uh, mild chills, nausea, uh, but nothing really serious. Um, and then people ask about the long-term effects. How can we be sure that these things are safe for long-term effects? And the answer is, while these vaccines against COVID-19 haven't been around that long, RNA vaccines in general have. Remember, we first tried this out in humans in 2011, trying to vaccinate against cancer. And we've been trying different RNA vaccines ever since. And in all of that time, 20 years since the first one, there haven't been any reports of long-term effects from RNA vaccines. So these things are very safe. Who should not take the vaccine now? And this is information according to the CDC. You should not take the vaccine now if you're younger than the allowed age, which right now is if you're under 16 for Pfizer or under 18 for Moderna. If you have a current COVID-19 infection or if you're in quarantine after being exposed to COVID-19. If you took uh, COVID-19 monoclonal antibody therapy in the last three months, you should not take the vaccine now. You should wait until three months after your, your antibody therapy. If you had a severe allergic reaction, so an anaphylactic reaction to the first dose of the vaccine, you should not take the second dose of the vaccine. If you have a known allergy to polyethylene glycol or polysorbate, which are two mild detergents that are used in the vaccine, you should not take the vaccine. Um, if you had COVID-19 in the last three months and you're concerned about risks of anaphylaxis, then it is okay for you to wait until three months after your COVID-19 infection. Uh, there are no other contraindications listed, okay? So if you have immune disorders, if you have cancer, if you have bleeding disorders, if you have food allergies or animal allergies or environmental allergies, oral medication allergies, any of these, that none of these mean that you should not take the vaccine. In fact, a lot of them mean you really should take the vaccine because you're at greater risk for serious COVID-19. But right now, none of those are contraindications to taking the vaccine. Uh, another question I get a lot, do the vaccines work against the new strains that you hear a lot about? And the short answer is probably, but there are some caveats. So uh, a couple of the new strains that have been in the news a lot. The first is the UK strain, which is the strain that were, was lighting the news on fire saying, oh, there's a more infectious strain of COVID-19 around and it actually invoked a, a distressing amount of doom saying. Um, the, uh, the vaccine effectiveness of both of the currently available vaccines uh, has been demonstrated against the UK strain and they are, are perfectly effective, just as effective against the UK strain, okay? Then there's another strain that came out of South Africa and this is, this is often called the South African variant, all right? 
Um, and this has been concerning to people because there's some evidence that suggests that the vaccines are less, um, are, are less protective against the South African variant. And the answer to that is yes, it appears that some of these vaccines, all of these vaccines are less protective against the South African variant, some of them considerably less. So let's talk about what we know. Um, for the adenovirus vaccines, the adenovirus vaccines appear to be pretty heavily impacted. So they, the, the effectiveness appears to go down from 70 to 80% down to about 50 to 60%. So a pretty serious drop in, in the percent protected. For the RNA vaccines, the ones that are currently available in the United States, um, right now, we don't know exactly how the effectiveness is impacted. What we do know is that the level of antibodies that your body makes in response to um, in response to the uh, South Africa strain after being inoculated with the RNA vaccines is reduced, and it's reduced by a decent amount. But the level of antibodies that your body makes still looks like it's going to be high enough to give you protection from the disease. Whether or not this uh, results in a measurable drop-off in effectiveness, we don't know yet, uh, but it will still at least have some effectiveness. And the good news is, is that all of the vaccines that have been tested so far against the South African strain, even if they don't prevent the mild cases of COVID-19, they all still seem to work very well against protecting against severe cases of COVID-19. The other nice thing about especially the, the RNA-based vaccines, but even the adenovirus vaccines, is that they're actually pretty simple to adjust to new strains because you don't have to make new protein. You don't have to engineer a new protein. All you have to do is make the RNA or the DNA that you package inside the carrier. And RNA and DNA is actually pretty easy to make nowadays. So we can actually make new booster shots to new strains using the new technology much, much faster than you can with a lot of older technologies. Um, and so you can expect to probably see, my guess is you can expect to start seeing new boosters approved um, in the coming year. So um, if, if we end up getting variants that the vaccines don't prevent, um, there's already talks with the FDA about doing a, a sped up um, approval cycle like they do with the flu shot. Um, there, you can expect to start seeing boosters coming out pretty regularly for, for new strains as they pop up. How long after I get the vaccine does it take to start working? Um, this is actually a really complicated question because different manufacturers measure their effectiveness differently. Um, and you also have to remember that there's a lag between when you're exposed to COVID-19 to the SARS-CoV-2 virus and when you develop symptoms. And they wouldn't actually mark you as having COVID-19 until you developed symptoms and started complaining about it. So if you're exposed on day two after the vaccine, you might not get tested for COVID-19 until day seven to day 14. And that's when you would show up on their graph. So since it's all so complicated, what I'd recommend to be safe is that you use the manufacturer's measurement criteria to determine how long it takes for the vaccine to be effective. For Pfizer, they measured uh, for seven days after the second dose. For Moderna, they measured for 14 days after the second dose. So after that time period, unless you're comfortable actually looking at the data and, and making your own interpretations, I would say after that time period, you could say that you have uh, the full benefit of the vaccine. Yeah, all right, big question. If I'm vaccinated, can I still spread SARS-CoV-2 to my loved ones? Uh, and the short answer is it's complicated. Um, so there are two types of immunity that vaccines can give you. Uh, or that natural immunity can give you. There's what's known as sterilizing immunity, which is where your immune, your immune response is such that the vaccine can't even infect you, okay? You can't even be an asymptomatic carrier, okay? If you encounter the pathogen, you eradicate the pathogen, all right? That's sterilizing immunity. And the other type is effective immunity, which means that if you encounter the pathogen, you don't get the symptoms of the disease, but you could still be an asymptomatic carrier. For vaccines generating true sterilizing immunity, where the virus cannot be detected in you once you're vaccinated, happens, but it's uncommon, okay? However, most vaccines, even vaccines that don't generate sterilizing immunity, 
at least reduce the rate of transmission. And oftentimes they reduce the rate of transmission drastically because they, they greatly reduce the amount of effective virus that your, your cells are shedding, okay, that, that they're producing. And so that makes you much less likely to infect other people. We don't yet have enough human data to say for sure how well the RNA vaccines prevent transmission, but we have some information that actually points in a very positive direction. So we do have animal data that suggests that they work very, very well to prevent transmission. So um, Moderna did some experiments in monkeys um, and they found that after they vaccinated the monkey and then intentionally uh, exposed the monkey, infected the monkey um, in the nasal cavity with SARS-CoV-2, two days after they inoculated the monkey, they could not detect any SARS-CoV-2 in the monkey. And that's pretty impressive. Um, we also know that humans who have recovered from COVID-19 naturally are unlikely to have even asymptomatic infections for over three months after recovery. And we know that the RNA vaccines elicit an even stronger and longer lasting immune response than natural COVID-19 infection. So we have very strong reason to believe that the RNA vaccines, even if they don't truly sterilize people from SARS-CoV-2, they should at least greatly reduce uh, their, their ability to transmit the disease. But we don't know for absolute positive yet because the vaccine hasn't been around in, long enough for us to actually make the measurements in people yet but all of the data points in a very positive direction. Okay, so if you're interested in learning more or keeping up with what's going on uh, as far as vaccine development, I've got a few, uh, a few uh, resources that I would recommend to you because there's a lot of misinformation out there. So there's a few resources that are reliable that I'd recommend to you. Uh, and these are kind of in order of, you know, more layperson friendly to less layperson friendly. Uh, I would start with the CDC's uh, um, website uh, on, cro on a coronavirus, on a, a COVID-19, uh, which you can find here. Um, it gives you a really, really good overview. And then you can even go down into actual, you know, you can actually read the emergency use authorization documents themselves if you really want, want to get into the weeds all through this uh, web portal. Um, Derek Lowe uh, runs a uh, blog uh, for um, Science Translational Medicine, which is a, a kind of a prestigious journal uh, when it comes to things like drug, drug discovery and drug development. Um, and he talks a lot about COVID-19 vaccine development, how they work, and he does it in a pretty uh, layperson friendly fashion. So I would recommend keeping up with his blog uh, if you're interested. Uh, he, he, he's one of the people that actually really knows what he's talking about. Uh, and then finally, if you really want to get into the weeds, uh, the RAPS COVID-19 vaccine tracker is a good way to keep track of all the different vaccines that are being, that are in development or have been approved in various parts of the world um, and, and get kind of a good, a good uh, entry portal into, into compare and contrast and reading more about them. So if you want to know about Sputnik, uh, the Russian COVID-19 vaccine, Sputnik 5, um, the, RAC, the RAPS COVID-19 vaccine tracker is a good place to start. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sharp. And as I mentioned in the chat earlier, um, you can use the Q&A tool to type some questions. But before we get to those, we did have several uh, questions that came in ahead of time from alumni. And I want to go through uh, some of those first. Um, you you'd, uh, touched on some of this, um, but if we want to talk about some misinformation, uh, there were a couple of questions. I'm going to go ahead and combine these two into one. Uh, that we're asking about um, an adverse uh, reaction, based, basically asking about uh, causing sterility or um, what could it, you know, anyone who wants to get pregnant in the future, they may not want to take the, uh, um, the, the vaccine because they're worried about what this could do to a future pregnancy. Okay. Uh, so uh, first thing, uh, does the vaccine cause sterility? No. Um, now your concern, if you're concerned about pregnancy, um, future pregnancy, right? Um, then I can tell you this. So we know what happens to the RNA after it gets injected into you, okay? So the, the injection of the RNA vaccine is done into the muscle and we can track where the RNA goes. And basically what happens is some of the RNA stays in your muscle and the rest of it goes to your liver. Absolutely none of it go to your reproductive organs. They don't go to your ovaries. They don't go to your testes. Uh, they go to your muscle or your liver, and then they, they're broken down 
and they cease to exist. So um, there is absolutely no reason and no data after 20 years to indicate that there is even the slightest possibility that these RNA vaccines will affect future pregnancies um, or, or uh, affect, uh, cause any effect to your sterility or lack thereof. We have a, a couple of questions that came in from alumni um, dealing with uh, the vaccine and age. Um, uh, one alum wrote, some doctors, uh, medical doctors oppose vaccine. Uh, I'm 71, should I get the COVID vaccination? Okay, so again, my disclaimer, I'm not a medical doctor, so I cannot give you advice on whether or not to give the vaccine. What I can do is give you information and I can tell you, I can give you examples of what I've done. Um, so uh, the, for people who are 71, including healthy people who are 71, um, it is recommended that the COVID vaccine be uh, received unless you have one of the contraindications. So unless you have, you know, a severe allergy to polyethylene glycol or, or something else that was on that very, very short list, uh, you should absolutely get this disease because you are at a significantly elevated risk um, of uh, severe complications from COVID-19. Um, and I can tell you that um, I, uh, as a person who has a pre-existing condition that qualifies me in the state of Mississippi, I have been vaccinated myself. Um, and so hopefully that makes my opinion on the matter pretty clear. Um, so, you know, I, I can't say you should get the vaccine, but I can tell you I got the vaccine and the CDC thinks you should get the vaccine. Next question, it may also run into the, uh the murky area of giving advice, uh, medical advice, but uh, this alum wrote, um, the alum will be 65 years old in the fall, is in great health. Uh, is it wise to wait on a release of a single dose vaccine or should an appointment be made now to go ahead and set up the, uh, the two dose vaccine? So the single dose vaccine um, is one of the adenovirus based vaccines. Um, and as I showed in the table earlier, uh, our evidence seems to indicate that the adenovirus vaccines are less effective than the RNA-based vaccines. Um, the safety profile of the RNA vaccines is very, very good. Um, and so, you know, talk with your doctor. Uh, but there's absolutely no, there's no scientific evidence that suggests that it would be more unsafe to take the RNA vaccines. And in fact, it would probably be safer to take the RNA, the two dose RNA vaccines that are currently available. Sticking with the, the uh, topic of age, uh, someone wrote in, why is it currently not recommended for uh, children? And uh, on the back end of that is another one uh, that is, do you have to wear a mask and social distance after you're fully vaccinated? Okay, so let me take the first one. Uh, let me take the first question first, which is about children. Um, it's not recommended for children um, because it wasn't tested on children. Um, while my guess is um, it would be completely safe to give to children, um, when it comes to our children's health, we don't wanna rely on my guess. Um, and when it came to testing the COVID-19 vaccines, um, the priority was not placed on children because children are at the lowest risk for serious complications of COVID-19 of just about any group anywhere. Um, and so it wasn't tested on children, so it's not recommended on children. Um, the, the, the Pfizer vaccine was tested on people, on children 16 and 17, and so it's recommended for children 16 to 17. The Moderna vaccine was tested on 18 and up, so it's recommended on 18 and up. Um, I've heard about, I've heard talks about looking into trials, clinical trials with children. Um, but my guess is that they're not a high priority just because children are not a high priority vaccination target right now. And then the, the, the second question was about wearing masks and social distancing after vaccination, right? So that comes back to the issue of uh, what type of immunity do the vaccines give me? Um, so first, I can give you the CDC recommendations. The CDC recommendations are that once you've been vaccinated, you should continue all of the COVID-19 prevention measures that you have been taking taken up until then. Um, I can also tell you that this recommendation is not universally agreed upon by the epidemiology and, and virology community. Uh, some people think that they are too stringent and that they increase the reluctance to get the vaccine because people don't see the point in getting the vaccine if they can't 
do any of the things they weren't allowed to do before. So I, I will say that's an active debate that's kind of going on right now. Um, as a matter of public policy, the state of Mississippi has decided to put a lot of the responsibility of how to properly prevent COVID-19 transmission on the individual, which means that you have to make the decision for yourself um, what you should and should not do. Uh, whether or not I think that's wise is, is a completely different topic for a different day, but that's what we're doing. Um, and so uh, my recommendation is you have to look at the situation that you're in. So I'll give you an example of me, right? I've been vaccinated. My wife, uh, who is my age um, and in perfectly good health, uh, and my two children have not. I don't live with um, I don't live with my parents. I don't have any elderly people in my life. I don't have anybody at particular risks of complications in my life. Um, and so, for a person in my situation, what I chose to do was after I was vaccinated and I waited the appropriate period of time, um, I came back to the office because I was working at home. Um, uh, but while I come back to the office, whenever I am not in my office by myself, I wear my respirator. Um, I do eat in restaurants occasionally now, but I only eat in restaurants that are just about empty. And whenever I do, I wear my respirator until the food arrives and I put my respirator back on once I'm done eating. Um, so that's an example of the kind of choices I made after I was vaccinated and waited the appropriate amount of time. Um, ultimately, the CDC recommendations are you continue to do everything that you were doing before. Um, and the Mississippi recommendations are, you know, figure it out. Sorry, but <laughs> uh, so um, as, as a person who, you know, if you're a person who is at risk or you're living with people that are at risk, I would recommend being more conservative because we still don't know uh, how well vaccinated people transmit the virus. Although again, it looks very positive. Um, if you are not living with people at high risk for complications and some of the restrictions that you've made have made a serious negative impact on your quality of life, you might consider it worth the risk to change some of what you're doing. Um, but it, it really is the kind of thing that you've got to look at on a case by case basis right now. Sorry for the confusing answer, but it's a confusing topic. On to uh, the booster shot. Uh, so the folks who have gotten that first round, uh, what's the purpose of the booster shot and is the biological response to the two doses fundamentally different? Right. So the purpose of the booster shot is to um, provide a stronger immune response and a longer lasting immune response. Um, the, the fundamentals of the immune response haven't changed, right? In both cases, it's still a combined B cell and killer T cell response. Um, it's just the level, the magnitude of the response is greater after the booster. Um, and based on what we know so far, it's going to be longer lasting after the booster. And then someone asked if um, they'll need a third shot to uh, protect against the South African variant. That's a really good question. Um, so maybe. Um, we still don't know exactly how well the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are going to prevent uh, the South African variant. Um, I would say that I am middling optimistic about it, uh, but I wouldn't be shocked if the effectiveness drops from 95% to 80%. Um, I still expect the vaccines to be pretty dang good, but maybe not brilliantly good like they are against the base variant. Um, but what they are, what they do seem to be really brilliant at is preventing serious COVID infection. And so if you want to prevent yourself from getting COVID-19 at all, then there's a reasonable chance that you will get a booster shot after a year that contains a new variant or maybe multiple new variants, depending on what happens in the next, you know, six, eight, 10 months. Um, on the other hand, there's a reasonable chance that if you got the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines, you won't need a booster. Um, it's, it's really too early to tell. You may have covered this a little bit, but I think it's uh, important to come back to um, and, and to answer these uh, questions submitted by the alums. Uh, but it, uh, one was, if you've contracted the virus and recovered, is it necessary to take the vaccine? Right. So um, 
natural immunity, uh, based on the information that we have now, natural immunity appears to provide you a reasonably good level of protection for a minimum of three months after infection. And so one of the CDC recommendations is if you are um, concerned about adverse uh, reaction to the vaccine and you have had COVID-19 in the past, then it is recommended that you wait until three months after your COVID-19 infection and then get your vaccine. So I would say that you have about a, you have a, at least a three month window um, after, after you've been infected and recovered uh, to wait to get your vaccine if, if, if you wanna wait for a little bit. But you can get it as soon as you are out of isolation. Is the vaccine FDA approved? The vaccine has an emergency use authorization from the FDA, which is different than FDA approved. Um, so it depends on what you mean by FDA approved. Um, basically, the FDA says, yes, you can go ahead and give it and you should go ahead and give it, but it has not been formally FDA approved yet. It's been, it's been authorized for emergency use. Uh, another alum asked, what is the uh, risk of not taking the vaccine? The risk of not taking the vaccine is that you contract COVID-19, um, which means that, you know, the risk of COVID-19 are everything from an asymptomatic or mild case all the way up to uh, death, permanent debilitation, uh, and passing it on to your loved ones and strangers. What about cancer patients? Uh, should cancer patients take the vaccine? Yes, cancer is uh, not a contraindication for the vaccine. So cancer patients may take the vaccine. Um, and cancer is one of the Mississippi Department of Health um, identified uh, pre-existing conditions that is authorized to take the vaccine now. Uh, and so hopefully that answers your, that, that is the opinion of the public health uh, authorities is that yes, you should take the vaccine. Okay, I'm going to dip into the uh, the Q and A uh, tab, and uh, the first one, uh, Rasha asked a question: What is the difference between the South African mutant, other mutants in England, and the the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and are the vaccines effective against those variants? Okay, so the actual differences I'm not going to get into because if we're going to get into that, um, I'm it, it's going to get real technical real quick. Um, so uh, basically there, there's some small changes in, in some of the parts um, and there's some of the parts that, uh, that some of the antibodies that you make might recognize. And so when you change those parts, then those antibodies don't recognize it as well. Um, and so that can, that can change how the immune system is able to identify uh, the virus and attack it. Um, and then what was, the, what was the second part of the question again, Scott? It was, uh, are the vaccines effective against those variants? Yeah, and, and so um, the UK variant, the vaccines appear to be perfectly effective against, um, again, the South African variant, um, there is decreased effectiveness. So in the adenovirus vaccines, the effectiveness appears to drop uh, by about roughly 20 percentage points, best we can tell right now. Um, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, which are the ones currently authorized for use in, in the United States, um, we don't yet have information on the effectiveness, um, but uh, the, what data we do have suggests that while the um, immune response is less against the South African variant, uh, it should still be strong enough to provide good protection in most people. And Rasha had a uh, follow-up question asking, uh, what makes the South Africa va variant the most dangerous of all the variants? I wouldn't say it's the most dangerous. I would say that it's the one that escapes the vaccine best. Um, and that's why it's causing concern is because the, the, it actually appears to interfere with the vaccine. Um, but it doesn't appear to be more deadly than the base variant of COVID-19. And if I remember right, it, it's not even considerably more infectious than the base variant of COVID-19. It just is not recognized by, uh, at least by the adenovirus vaccines as well. Okay, I'm gonna go back to uh, the a list that was sent in ahead of time. Uh, an alum asked, uh, do I take Tylenol and Zyrtec pre and post vaccine? I've heard two different thoughts on this. Right, so um, first I'll start with Zyrtec. Uh, I haven't heard anything about Zyrtec. Um, so I would say if you need Zyrtec to control your seasonal allergies, you go ahead and take it. Um, Tylenol, there is some very, very scant data 
that suggests that taking pain relievers um, with your with your COVID-19 vaccine gives a very mild reduction in the immune response to it. Um, so a couple things I'd want to say here. First, the data is is pretty preliminary. Um, I, I would not bet even small amounts of money on it holding up. Um, it's way too early to tell. Second, even if the data end up being correct, um, the, the reduction in the immune response is small um, compared to the immune response that the vaccine generates. You will, even if you take your pain relievers, uh, you will have plenty of immune response left over to protect you against COVID-19. Um, so my recommendation is um, I wouldn't pre-dose before getting the vaccine because some people don't have any negative effects from the vaccine. They don't even have pain or tenderness. Um, and for the ones that do, uh, you know, in, in, in most people, it's manageable. So I wouldn't pre-dose, but if after you get the vaccine, you feel like you need something, then, you know, I wouldn't suffer. Go ahead and take, go ahead and take some Tylenol or something. Another alum sent in a question that since the common cold is also a coronavirus, why has there not been any cures or vaccines for that? So the coronavirus causes a small percentage of, of common colds, um, not all of them, not even most of them. Um, and it's a different coronavirus. So there are lots and lots of different coronaviruses. And, and if you make vaccines against one, they're not gonna work against another. Um, but that being said, um, the main reason why there's no vaccine or cure for the common cold uh, is because there's not a whole lot of human health reason to do it. Um, if you if you really take a look at the common cold, um, it doesn't cause death. It doesn't cause long-term debilitation. Symptoms tend to be mild. Um, and with a few exceptions, um, like uh, RSV and parainfluenza, which there are treatments for, and there's work being done on them, um, which can cause serious uh, complications in some patients. Um, most viruses that cause the common cold, they just cause a common cold and then you get better. Um, and, and, you know, scientists, you know, we don't get in it for the money, we get in it to help people. And if the, the question is, you know, do I work on, do I work on COVID-19 or do I work on the common cold, right? Do I, do I work on HIV or do I work on the common cold? Um, for, for most scientists, you know, we want to go where we do the most good and, and the common cold is just, you know, it, it's annoying, but it's, it's not going to kill you. So there's not a whole lot of passion behind curing the common cold. Uh, that's, that's the truth of it. If you take immunosuppressants for rheumatoid arthritis, will you have a lower response to the vaccines? Possibly. Yeah, possibly. Um, so, uh, so immunosuppressants are quite probably going to dampen your immune response. Um, depending on what exactly it is, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of dictate what effect it has. That doesn't mean you shouldn't get the vaccine, um, but this is one case, and I, I'm not being facetious here. Um, I strongly recommend you talk to your doctor about the uh, precautions that you will need to take after vaccination um, because there's a reasonable chance that the vaccine will not uh, give you the protection that you want. And there are some tests that you can run to measure how much protection, how much of an immune response the vaccine raised. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you really should talk with your medical doctor about. And Lisa was asking, do you think the uh, RNA vaccines will still be available once the vaccines are available for the general population? Um, yes. So what I expect to happen is that uh, while the, the vaccine supply will continue to be limited um, because these, you know, these vaccines are amazing. They're an amazing scientific and medical accomplishment. I mean, they're, they are, you know, they are our generation's uh, version of landing on the moon. This has really been just truly impressive to watch. Um, the downside of the RNA vaccines is that they are difficult to manufacture and they are really difficult to handle. And so that's caused a lot of backup and it's caused a lot of slowdowns when it comes to manufacturing. Um, there's work that's being done to scale up manufacturing. They're trying to get other drug companies um, kind of geared up to help them make their drug. Um, and so eventually that will scale up. But for a while, I expect we will continue to be supply limited. 
to where not everybody that wants the vaccine can get it. Um, this will eventually get better and better, uh, but for 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 the for the immediate future, I expect we will be supply limited, and I would recommend that you know once you have once you are authorized to get the vaccine and you've decided that you want it, you go ahead and schedule your appointment quickly um, rather than wait because if you wait, it might be gone, and you might have to wait longer. Dr. Sharp, here's an interesting that one that came in um, ahead of time. It says next year, if we're still required to take the vaccine, and uh, this alum uh, says if, if, if I took Pfizer this year, well, I need to take that the Pfizer vaccine again next year. Right. So it's so right now the CDC just changed their policy on this um, either yesterday or today, very, very recently. Um, and basically the CDC's position is that uh, if you took the Pfizer vaccine for the first dose, you should take the Pfizer vaccine for the second dose, unless there are extraordinary circumstances. If there are extraordinary circumstances, then it is approved for you to mix doses. So to take Pfizer for the first and Moderna for the second or vice versa. But if possible, um, you should take whatever you took for the first dose for the second. And the reason why is just an abundance of caution. Um, that's how the results were measured. And so that's what we want to stick to, right? When, when, the, when the vaccines were approved, we didn't mix doses. And so we want to not mix doses. Looking at the vaccines, they should be mix and matchable, which is why the CDC has said, you know, if things, get, if things go sideways, then, then you can do it. Um, if we can, it's best to take Pfizer for two if you took Pfizer for one and take Moderna for number two if you took Moderna for one. We had two separate questions come in uh, from alumni early, uh, basically asking about concern over how quickly the vaccines were uh, developed. Can you uh, comment on that? Yeah, um, so uh, I actually look at it the other way. Um, I am incredibly pleased that the vaccines were made so quickly. And, and what's important to understand is the vaccines, they were made quickly, uh, but they weren't made quickly because people cut corners. They were made quickly because the, the scientific and, and uh, biopharma community uh, spent tremendous resources um, in conjunction with some, some really tremendous resource output from various uh, governments um, in order to fund a really ambitious um, and, and, and very thorough uh, production development and testing cycle. Um, and that these vaccines were very thoroughly tested. Um, you know, the the if you're really interested, you know, the you can you can read the CDC summaries of the results from all of the clinical trials. You know, you can you can go into the databases and, and pull out the adverse events. Uh, you can measure the effectiveness. Um, you can see the data for yourself if you want. And I've looked at the data for, for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And, you know, it's very convincing. It's very impressive. You know, it's, uh, and, and the FDA uh, has been, um, they've shown, in my opinion, they've shown the appropriate balance between looking out for patient safety while still recognizing kind of the urgent pandemic situation that we're in and the real risk that this this pandemic has has uh, posed to a lot of members of our community. I mean, based on our best estimates, we have lost half a million people to COVID-19. And that is that is a lot of people. Um, so no, um, I am not in the least bit concerned about the timeline. I am I am deeply impressed and, you know, somewhat in awe of how quickly that 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 the, we've been able to generate vaccines that are this effective this safe and at most of the clinical trial designs that we've seen um, we're very very thorough very very careful with the possible exception of the astrazeneca trial which had problems um, the rest of them have been very very professionally done um, and it's really been it's really been uh inspiring to see so no i i would my personal opinion is I am not at all concerned about the timeline. I'm impressed by the timeline because the quality of the data that they generated um, in such a short time is just really, really fantastic. 
You know, another question that was sent in early asked, will we need to vaccine annually like we uh, vaccine for the flu? That's a really good question. Uh, the answer is I don't know. Um, so the downside, right? Um, the downside to this being done so quickly is there is no substitute for, for long-term studies when it comes to effectiveness, right? Um, for, for safety, you know, we can compare this to other vaccines um, and, and that have been around for 20 years and, and talk about safety. But for effectiveness, the effectiveness is going to be specific to this vaccine for this disease. And we don't know what the long-term effectiveness is going to be. So I can't, I can't, I hesitate to guess whether or not we're going to need annual boosters. And that's not even counting the fact that, you know, do we get new strains popping up? And part of whether or not we get new vaccine resistant strains popping up has to do with how quickly and how thoroughly do we vaccinate? You know, if, if, we, if we leave significant parts of our population unvaccinated, then they just serve as breeding grounds for developing new vaccine resistant strains. Um, and if that happens, then yes, we will be vaccinating with boosters quite possibly for the foreseeable future. Um, on the other hand, if we have an aggressive strategy that people buy into and we get a very, very large chunk, you know, we get 80% of our population vaccinated, then there's a good chance that we could just snuff this thing out and not have to worry about vaccine resistance strains, in which case we might not need boosters. So it, it really depends on how a lot of things go. We had a couple of questions come in about herd immunity. Um, someone asking, you know, what, what actually makes herd immunity and, and where is the United States in respect to herd immunity and where could that data be found? Right. So um, herd immunity. So the idea of herd immunity is that as more people get vaccinated, okay, um, there are fewer people available for an infected person to spread the virus to. And in order for the virus to persist in a population, it needs to spread itself to, on average, at least one person per infected person, right? So if, if, you, if, if a virus spreads itself to one person per infected person, then the virus will stay at the same level over time. If it gets above one person per infected person, then the virus will slowly grow. If it gets less than one person per infected person, then the virus will slowly die out. And the idea of herd immunity is if you reach enough people that are immune to the disease, that it spreads to less than one person per infected person, then the virus starts to die out. And the people that didn't get vaccinated or got vaccinated but ended up not getting immunity from it uh, are still protected because everyone around them can't pass them the virus because they're immune. That's the idea of herd immunity. Our best back of the envelope guess for herd immunity, and I say back of the envelope, it's actually a little more complicated than that. Uh, but our best model for herd immunity states that we need to get about 75% of our population immune to the virus in order to provide herd immunity to the rest. Um, and as far as where we are at right now, we are not at that and we're not that close to that, but we're getting there. Um, and so the other thing that's important to remember is herd immunity is not an on off switch, right? So as more and more people become resistant, uh, the virus is going to be able to spread more, the virus is going to spread more and more slowly because it's going to have fewer people that it can jump to. And so that means that what we should see is we should see that the number of infected people, the number of new infections, the number of people dying from COVID-19 should start to tail off um, until eventually we reach herd immunity. So it's, it's, it's a process more than a goal, I'd say. Um, and it's one that we are moving towards, but we are definitely not there yet. And that's one reason why I encourage everyone who can to do their part, um, if not for themselves, then for the person taking immunosuppressants next to them who might not benefit from the vaccine, um, you know, get vaccinated. It, it, it really is important, not just for you, it's important for the community. Go back to the Q&A. Um, Ali asks, is it okay to take two vaccines that have different mechanisms or modes of action? Um, that has not been looked at for COVID-19. Um, and right now, I don't think they would let you. So I would say, you know, I, I would say it wouldn't be something I would recommend um, just because there's no data on it. Um, I can't think off the top of my head why it would be a problem, but you know, 
you sh when it comes to things like like health, you should not listen to my gut. So, um, you know, take take take. Right now, we have enough vaccines, and we're our logistics are such that if you get the Pfizer vaccine in Mississippi, then you will have the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. If you get the Moderna vaccine in Mississippi, you will have the second dose of the Moderna vaccine. So right now, I would recommend that people stick with the the CDC recommendations and and just go with what we know works. And Robert also typed into the Q&A, how long will the vaccines be effective against uh, COVID-19? So um, that's a good question. Um, so we are not entirely sure because we don't have the longitudinal studies. What we do know is we know that natural immunity um, appears to work for a minimum of three months and in most people, it looks like it's considerably longer, more like you know a minimum of six to nine months. But right now, the official line is a minimum of three months. And we know that uh, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines induce a stronger immune response than natural infection. Uh, and so uh, it is uh, to be uh, expected that the um, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines will last longer than natural immunity. Um, the right now, uh, the company line for Moderna is they expect their vaccines to last an absolute minimum of one year. And I think that's a pretty conservative estimate. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they last, you know, several years, uh, but I would expect them to last at least one year. A question submitted ahead of time asks, uh, do we have any idea when pharmacies and medical providers will have access to the vaccines to distribute? So last I heard, um, the, there were plans in the state of Mississippi currently underway to get this vaccine out to Walmart pharmacies, which I think are the contractors for, for pharmacy vaccinations here. I'm not sure if those have been carried out yet or not. Um, last I heard was last Wednesday, I was in on a meeting where they said that uh, those plans were currently underway and being carried out. Um, I don't know exactly where they are, but if they're not at Walmart pharmacies now, I'd expect them to be at Walmart pharmacies in the next few weeks. Um, and uh, beyond that, um, that is not information that I am currently privy to, whether or not they will be spread beyond that uh, as far as community pharmacies go. As far as I know, Walmart's the only pharmacy that's getting them in Mississippi right now. And Ellen wrote into the Q&A, what's the status of vaccination in the rest of the world and what effect does that have on the U.S. getting out of the pandemic? Yeah, so um, the, the state of vaccination in the rest of the world varies wildly. So the nation of Israel is doing really, really well. Um, other nations are not doing as well. Um, the United States is currently doing pretty good um, compared to the rest of the world. Um, Israel is making everybody else look bad. But other than Israel, we are doing pretty well compared to the rest of the world. Um, and, you know, we, we live in a global community. So as long as we keep having airplanes and boats that come in from other nations, the vaccination state of other countries is going to play some role in how well we um, how well we are able to maintain um, a pandemic free society once we achieve it here. So I, I would definitely encourage people to keep an eye on global vaccination rates as well. While while American vaccination rates are most important to us in the short term, global vaccination rates are going to be very, very important in the battle against this pandemic for the long term. Another uh, question that was sent ahead of time, how closely will the government monitor those vaccinated and where will they publish any data on adverse results? So adverse results are, uh, are um, collected and published through something called VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Event Recording System, I think is what it stands for, V-A-E-R-S. Um, this is a national database um, and uh, they publish periodic summaries of uh, the adverse events that have been reported. So when I talked about uh, the, the rate of adverse events for Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, that's where I got the, the information from was the VAERS database. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's where you look if you wanna actually see those numbers. In Q&A, Bill asks, can you tell from analyzing a virus how it will affect a person? That is a very broad question. Um, so I can take this a few ways. Um, if the question is, can I look at the three-dimensional shape of a virus and tell how it's going to affect a person? The answer is in very, very broad strokes probably um, because different types of viruses have different general shapes. 
And a lot of times those shapes are going to correspond with the type of virus that it is. So for example, coronaviruses tend to be respiratory viruses. Um, then in some cases, yes, you can look at the shape of a virus and make a reasonable guess as to the general type of infection that this virus may or may not cause. Because remember, a lot of coronaviruses don't cause any disease in people. Um, if you're asking a more specific question, like, can I look at the three dimensional, could I have looked at the three dimensional shape of SARS-CoV-2 and told you that this was going to be a global pandemic? No, I couldn't have done that. Um, now, could I have studied the SARS-CoV-2 virus in detail, um, along with a dedicated team of experts with different expertises, and then told you that, yeah, I could, this, this could be really, really nasty. Yeah, I could probably have done that. Um, but that takes, that takes incredibly lucky guesswork to find a virus before it becomes a pandemic and do that in-depth study on it. Um, so yeah, we have the tools to, to do that kind of thing, but you gotta get really lucky to hit that shot in the dark because um, there are a lot of viruses out there and there are new ones coming along all the time. Uh, ahead of time, someone asked, are there any issues or adverse effects with the COVID vaccines for people who have had the monoclonal antibody therapy? Right. So no, um, there are no indications of additional adverse effects. What there are concerns about is whether or not the vaccine would be effective. So in monoclonal antibody therapy, what, what we do is instead of convincing your immune system to make antibodies, we make the antibodies and we give them to you. Okay. Um, and the idea is that's that's kind of a treatment to help people who have had you know, COVID-19 help keep them from developing a severe case, we give their immune system kind of a, a boost of, of antibodies that we make outside of their body. Um, the problem is, is that if we then inject people with, uh, with uh, a vaccine and they start making the spike protein, the S protein, um, they have these antibodies that we injected them with that will then attack the S protein before their regular immune system can recognize it. And so the concern is, is that if you've had recent monoclonal antibody therapy, uh, your immune response to the vaccine might not very, be very good, which is why the CDC recommends if you've had monoclonal antibody therapy, then you should wait until three months after your therapy um, before getting the vaccine. Um, in that case, your natural immunity that you built up should protect you. And in those three months, the, that monoclonal antibody therapy should have plenty of time to get out of your system. And in Q&A, Mal Malika, uh, writes, do we have to do PCR before vaccination? No, absolutely not. Um, the vaccine is perfectly safe to give to, um, to uh, uh, people who have COVID-19 infections. The, the only reason that they tell people who have known COVID-19 infections um, not to get it is because they don't want to expose the healthcare workers uh, to infected people. Um, so as long as you don't suspect that you have COVID-19, so you don't have symptoms, you don't have a positive test, and you haven't been exposed to COVID-19 positive people uh, recently, so you're not under quarantine or isolation, then you should, then you, you're uh, eligible to get the vaccine. Uh, Rasha just wrote into the Q&A a, a pretty interesting question. Uh, what makes a person in close contact to a positive COVID case not get the virus or test negative? Is it a strong immunity? or that the per of that person or a weak virus? Uh, well, I mean, it doesn't have to be either. Um, so you, 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 get the co you get COVID-19 when the SARS-CoV-2 virus, when a, when a sufficient amount of SARS-CoV-2 virus um, infects the cells in your nasal cavity. That's where the infection appears to, to start. And so you can be in close contact with someone and then just through sheer chance, not breathe in any droplets that they have breathed out. Okay, um, the 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 entire thing around close contact, the CDC recommendations for social distancing and for masks and everything, these are all risk mitigation strategies. Okay, um, there is no magic switch that after six feet the virus dies. Um, six feet is just a convenient um, measurement that we use in order to. Um, kind of give you guidelines about risk management. But to be honest, if you can be more than six feet away from people, that's better. Uh, same thing with 15 minutes. Um, you know, we use 15 minutes as a definition for close contact, because if we don't have some definition, then contact tracers will have to call everybody in the nation every day to see if you had contact with anybody. And that's just not practical. And so we define close contact as closer than six feet for 15 minutes. Um, but there is nothing magical about the 15 minute number. You can pick up COVID-19 after a 
one second exposure to someone who happened to breathe a droplet that you breathed in. Um, or you can hang out in a room for days with someone who's infected and just happen not to breathe in whatever, whatever virus laden droplets they breathe out. Um, I definitely would not, would not jump to the uh, conclusion that a person who was in a room with a COVID-19 positive person had some kind of super immune system. Um, I would be much more likely to say they got lucky and they should not push their luck by doing it again. Dr. Sharp, I'm going to get to a couple more questions and I think we'll move on. Um, if we don't build permanent natural immunity to SARS-CoV-2, why do we only need the vaccine once? So we don't know if we only need the vaccine once. Um, right now we're giving the vaccine once and then we'll have to look and see, you know, we'll monitor people and see how long the, the immunity lasts. Um, but, you know, so, so a few things about natural immunity. We don't know how long our natural immunity actually lasts. There are verified cases of people who were infected by COVID-19 becoming infected again by COVID-19, so getting reinfected. Um, the thing about these cases, though, is that they are rare. And in almost every case, the second COVID-19 infection in most cases, they were asymptomatic. In pretty much all cases, if they weren't asymptomatic, they were incredibly mild. So they still had very good protection against serious COVID-19. Um, and we don't know how long that protection is going to last. Um, this is still a relatively new virus to us. Um, as we learn more and as we measure the longevity of the vaccine-induced uh, um, immunity, um, we will develop a booster schedule um, and by we, I mean, you know, they, the, the FDA, um, will develop a booster schedule uh, for maintaining immunity until the pandemic is eradicated or, you know, or not, or we just keep getting shots like we do for the flu. Um, so, yeah, so it's a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, we don't, we don't know the answer yet, but ultimately, you know, we'll keep an eye on it. And when you need a booster, you'll get a booster. Okay. And do you see a robust vaccine program eradicating the virus? If not, what will our vaccine programs look like going forward? Yeah. Um, so that is going to depend in large part on us, on humanity. Um, we have the vi we have the tools. Okay. The RNA vaccines are sufficiently effective. And they are easy enough to adapt to new strains um, to where I fully expect that if we vaccinated widely, we would eradicate the virus. Um, the problem is, can we vaccinate widely? And do we have the political willpower to vaccinate widely? Uh, because, you know, we, we, still, we still have measles, right? Measles has been around forever and it's still here because some people will not vaccinate. Um, so that's not a technical question. That's a question of, of what do we, what do we value as people and what do we believe as people, right? Do we believe in science or do we believe in random people that, that say random things on, on the internet? Um, and I know where I land on that, that particular question. Um, but because of the way that we run our society, um, everybody right now gets to make that choice for themselves. Um, and until we get to the level where enough people make the choice that they believe in vaccines and they believe in biomedical science, um, then no, we're not going to eradicate this disease because we are not going to vaccinate enough people. Uh, one last question, uh, Dr. Sharp. Uh, we had, uh, I think, um, from afar, Sarah may have sent uh, some information on this, but we had a question in the Q&A asking about your, uh, your heparin nasal spray trial and, and where we are with that. Right. So where we are with that is we're looking for money to expand the trial. So, you know, I, I mentioned that I was really, really proud of how much data we were able to collect in a short time. And the reason we were able to collect that much data in such a short time is we threw enormous sums of money at it. To, to develop these huge clinical trials. And clinical trials are incredibly expensive. Um, and, and it's not because the money's not coming to me, right? I don't, I don't get paid for this. 
Um, the, the, they're expensive because you have to enroll a lot of people. You have to track a lot of people. You have to get them tested lots and lots of times. You have to provide them with all the doses of the, of the, uh, of the drug. Um, you have to keep track of everything. Um, it's really, really expensive. Um, so where we're at right now is we're talking with some pharmaceutical companies uh, to try to see if we can, um, if we can come up with uh, the funds to run a uh, phase one, phase two clinical trial for our uh, heparin nasal spray, um, which is a, it's a prophylactic. So it's a drug that you take to prevent um, the infection. Um, we are still very interested in pursuing it because uh, based on uh, our information, it looks like um, this prophylactic could be useful not only against COVID-19, uh, but also against other some other viruses. Um, and eventually, uh, the ultimate goal is, at least from my point of view, um, I want to have things in our arsenal so when you know COVID-24 or COVID-36 comes around, we're not starting back at ground zero trying to figure out you know how to keep people from dying. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, while, while, while vaccines have done phenomenally, I mean, just truly phenomenally this time, um, therapeutics did pretty poorly. Uh, we didn't do a great job of treating COVID-19. We've done a great job of making a vaccine against it. We didn't do a great job of treating it. Um, and and I, I'm still trying to move forward with the heparin trial, but right now it's just a question of money. Well, thank you, Dr. Sharp. Um, we're gonna end the Q&A right there and um... Can't thank you enough for uh, the information you provided and for you providing your time to us to uh, to talk about this uh, very popular uh, subject and timely subject. So if you have any questions that uh, that that didn't get answered, uh, please email your questions to me, and I will send them along to Dr. Sharp and and uh, relay some of his answers to you. Um, we've got a few more people to thank for making this this uh, thing happen. Whitney Tarpey and uh, Tom Hunter Pratt and Sarah Campbell, uh, they did the stuff behind the scenes that, that made sure it didn't go off the rail. They didn't get me off of mute, but they did make sure that the uh, thing didn't come crashing down. Um, uh, we do have more events like this that are, that are coming up. If you go to olemissalumni.com slash events, you will see uh, future topics that we have coming up and we're adding more on a daily basis. Um, and we hope that uh, even though we're enjoying this virtual series, we hope at some point we can get back in, uh, to in-person events and, and bring you uh, some information like this. Um, that's all that we have today. Uh, I appreciate everyone uh, participating. And uh, again, Dr. Sharp, thank you so much for your expertise and sharing it with us. It was my absolute pleasure. Thank you.